Greetings from the National Archives flagship building in Washington, D.C., which sits on the ancestral lands of the Nacotchtank peoples. I'm David Ferriero, Archivist of the United States, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's conversation with Woody Holton about his new book, Liberty is Sweet, which looks at the overlooked factors of the American Revolution and the roles of marginalized peoples. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you about two programs you can view later this month on our YouTube channel. On Wednesday, October 20th at 1 p.m., Francesca Morgan will talk about her new book, A Nation of Descendants, which traces Americans' fascination with tracking family lineage and explores how genealogy has always mattered in our country. And on Friday, October 22nd at noon, NASA astronaut Nicole Stott will discuss her work on the International Space Station and share insights from scientists, activists, and changemakers who are working to solve our greatest environmental challenges. Her new book is Back to Earth. The study of history explores the questions of why and how things happened. Sometimes what seems to be familiar is revealed to possess many facets. In his new book, Liberty is Sweet, Woody Holton seeks out the hidden history of the American Revolution. Holton used more than a thousand eyewitness accounts to construct this history. Many of those are freely available online for you to read for yourselves. The original words of leading figures of the revolution may be found on Founders Online a website hosted by the National Archives through the National Historical Publications and Records Commission. Children in elementary schools across America learn of the Declaration of Independence and the battles led by George Washington. Looking back nearly 250 years, the American Revolution and its outcome can appear inevitable. But engaging and defeating a military power such as Great Britain required the involvement of people for many walks of life. Liberty is Sweet uncovers the roles played by women, Native Americans, enslaved Africans and African Americans, and religious dissenters. Holton also focuses on often overlooked factors such as weather, geography, and disease. Too often we jump from July 4, 1776 to Washington's first presidency, ignoring over seven years of warfare. Liberty is Sweet gives us a fresh look at the American Revolution and the many people up and down the social spectrum who influenced it. Woody Holton is McCausland Professor of History at the University of South Carolina, where he teaches and researches early American history, especially the American Revolution. He's the author of several books, including Abigail Adams, which was awarded the Bancroft Prize. His second book, Unruly Americans and the Origins of the Constitution, was a finalist for the National Book Award. Joining him in conversation is Nicole Masquiel, Assistant Professor of History at the University of South Carolina, where she is also the Director of the Public History Program, a Peter and Bonnie McCausland Fellow and a Faculty Associate in African American Studies at the Walker International Institute. Now let's hear from Woody Holton and Nicole Masquiel. Thank you for joining us today. Well, welcome and thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm here with Woody Holton um, and I'm really excited to talk about his new book, Liberty is Sweet, The Hidden History of the American Revolution. Now, Woody, um, one of your, your big claims in this book is about the hidden influences on the American Revolution. So I really wanna talk about some of those. Uh, and I really wanted to start out first here talking about um, um, the different groups that you highlight uh, in, 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 this, in this narrative, this, this incredibly um, engrossing narrative about, uh, as you term, this hidden history. Uh, so, so let's jump into it. Uh, what, are, um, um, what are some of these major groups and these hidden influences, and why have they come to shape your research uh, so heavily? Well, first, Nicole, I want to thank you for doing this all University of South Carolina program with me. Um, I have a lot of reasons to be proud of our history program at USC, but the fact that we have two early Americans who can have a conversation uh, like this uh, is really cool, and I appreciate your, I know you have a class right after this, so I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, so some of the groups that I am talking about are Native Americans, who of course still occupied most of the continent uh, in 1776, the guys who declared independence called themselves the Continental Congress, but they occupied about a sixth of it. 
uh, and Native Americans about five six, and and they're of course significant in their own life, but they also really helped get the revolution started. And and I'd actually argue uh, that th there's a sense in which they won the war in the West. Indigenous people did. Uh, now one in five people in the thirteen colonies that rebelled were African American, and they too both hugely influenced the revolution. In fact, I'd argue that if it hadn't been for some of the things they were up to, the revolution might not have ever come to the South, which is where the wealth, of the, the great wealth of North America was. And, and, and a lot of the people, the largest colony was my home colony or state of Virginia. So I think African-Americans had a huge impact on the revolution and it in turn hugely influenced them uh, as, as you know from your own work, both positively and, and negatively. So that's another group, uh, African-Americans. Um, and people will probably be least surprised when I say uh, that women of all ranks and races have a huge impact because they always do uh, in war. But you know, you and I share a graduate student, uh, a, a former undergrad, now a grad student of ours, who's done amazing work on women's role in the Continental Army. So maybe we'll be able to talk a little bit about about Riley's work on that. But I also uh, could uh, have followed through on something that your dissertation advisor, Mary Beth Norton. Uh, wrote about uh, a few years before you were with her there uh, at Cornell about Esther Reed, who who formed a group in in Pennsylvania of women to to help the soldier. But she ended up getting into some rows with 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 uh, George Washington that that are worth talking about. So the the big three groups that I've mentioned are Native Americans, African Americans, and women. Yes, and and I I wanted to I, I definitely want to get to talking about. Uh, Esther Reed, but I really wanted to start with this kind of compelling um, view and the, the way that you you open the book, this compelling view of this 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 map uh, that shows uh, that shows um, that shows the continent as being a place, an indigenous place, right? Um, and 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 I I think that um, I I'm really I'm really compelled by how why you chose this image as, as a way to kind of come into this and also how you set your book uh, in um, this, this, this history of the revolution, you're starting it in what is known, you know, um, in, 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 in the United States as the, as the um, French Indian War, uh, but um, is, you know, known internationally as the Seven Years War, which, as you point out, is also a misnomer. Um, tell us a little bit about why you chose to highlight um, um, or centralize uh, the the this the, the continent as an indigenous place first and why you so focused on as starting this kind of history of the revolution with um the conflict um on the forks of the ohio okay great thanks hey brian <laughs> why don't we go ahead and put up that map that uh nicole is talking about of america in 1776 oh yes there's parliament and i i, I do want to make a quick point about that since the slide is there there's a real sense that when we ask why did the American Revolution happen, we're asking the wrong question. Or I'm sorry, when we ask why did the colonists rebel, we're asking the wrong question because there's a sense in which Parliament rebelled. That is, white colonists, the people in power, John Hancock and John Adams in Massachusetts, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson in Virginia, um, they were pretty satisfied with their role in the British Empire as of the year 1762. And it's these guys, the House of Commons in their old meeting chamber here, uh, who were dissatisfied and said, we wanna make changes. And so to, I, I wanted to put, put that slide in the list just to frame the whole discussion that we're really talking about the, grievan the British grievances against the colonies and things they wanted to change and, and did, and parliament did try to change and the colonists resentment of those changes uh, that would ultimately lead to revolution. So we'll get to those, but but Brian, if you'll go on straight to the, the um, next one is, the next slide is the image that uh, Nicole was talking about, uh, which is, uh, it's this is just North America, east of the Mississippi River, um, but um, uh, as Nicole pointed out, uh, and I did too, most of that territory, east, even east of the Mississippi, is still occupied by Native Americans. Uh, at this time. And uh, I based this map primarily on an atlas done by a scholar named Helen Hornbeck Tanner, but then uh, um, she was mostly focused on the Midwest. So many people helped me fill in uh, 
uh, other uh, native nations. And uh, one thing that I want to point out is that there are boundaries between those native nations. The old maps used to have the word Cherokee out there somewhere and the word Iroquois out there somewhere north of the word Cherokee, but it's only the words are on the map and not the boundaries as though Native Americans didn't have boundaries. They did. Now, those boundaries were contested just as they were in Africa and Europe and most of the rest of the world. But uh, it's, I think it's important to see that, that they these were nations in, in the sense of having boundaries. And also, uh, now it was space limited because there's only two pages in the book, but, but to put some of the native towns in there because so many of the maps uh, that accompany books on the revolution have Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Williamsburg, maybe Charlestown, South Carolina, which is now Charleston, and zero native towns as though they didn't live uh, in towns. And, and the vast majority of them east of the Mississippi did. Um, so, so just their presence is really important. But uh, I want to make the case that even if you were, and this is, I hope, an imaginary person, but if you were some imaginary person who didn't really care about Native American history at all, but you did care about why the American Revolution happened, then you've got to, still got to go look at Native Americans because of the huge role they played. And to answer your question about that, Nicole, um, one, one role that they played was um, resisting encroachments on their land. And that leads the British to draw a line along the crest of the Appalachian Mountains. You can actually see it in this map. The uh, shaded area is west of the mountains. And as of 1763, the British government said, uh, if you're a, a white settler or land speculator like Benjamin Franklin or Thomas Jefferson or George Washington, if you're a land speculator or settler, you can't go into the shaded area. You got to stay. Um, I didn't choose these colors, but the map maker makes a point. You got to stay in the white, the basically the white area, although it's also an African uh, area. Um, and that you can understand why the British did that, because this goes to the other part of your question, Nicole. Uh, the British had just finished this nine year war that we call the Seven Years War uh, or the French and Indian War against the French and Spanish and their many native allies. So almost all of the natives that you see on here, the Cherokees were one big exception, but most of the other native nations that you see on here, if they took a side in, the, in that war, it was the French side. And of course the British eventually won and the French almost entirely left North America, except for two tiny islands off of Newfoundland. So the British are thrilled to have won that war, but it was a long expensive war that nearly doubled their debt. And so, they, British officials and parliament understood something that people forget sometimes today, which is the most expensive thing a nation ever does is go to war. And they doubled their debt. They didn't want to do that again. And they said, how can we make sure or, or decrease at least the possibility of going to war against Native Americans? Well, one is by not stealing their land. And so we get the proclamation line of 1763. Um, there's also a lot of people heard of the proclamation line, but there's something else that people haven't heard so much of. And that is to enforce the proclamation line to keep colonists away from Indians and Indians away from colonists. The British government made a really pivotal decision in December of 1762. And that was the war is over. Uh, they wouldn't sign the treaty with the French until for another two months. But basically the war was over in December 1762. What you usually do if you're a country like Britain, you've been fighting a war overseas, you've won the war, you bring the troops home. But the British government decided to leave 10,000 soldiers in North America as basically peacekeeping troops. And Brian, if you'll show us the next slide, uh, the, this one obviously was a, a contemporary map made by the amazing map maker, Jeff Ward, but this one uh, was done at the time and those red rectangles, you can uh, download this, uh, people watching at home, this, uh, you can download this document as I did from the Library, uh, the Library of Congress. And there's, there's other versions of it in other places. But the red rectangles represent uh, the cantonment, that is the, where the troops were placed. And of course they had some in New York, they had to have a lot in Canada because they just conquered Canada. So Nova Scotia, for instance, 
but the bulk of the uh, and, and they had some in, in um, the Caribbean, but the bulk of them are what I would call peacekeeping troops as, as a sort of a human wall to keep the Indians and colonists apart. And, and then the question came up, uh, how do you pay for that? And that's what led the British Parliament to adopt the Stamp Act in 1765 and the Sugar Act the year before that, laying taxes on those uh, in order to come up with the money to fund these 10,000 troops. Uh, a lot of the textbooks that you and I learned on, Nicole, told us that, oh, yeah, the reason for the Stamp Act was to pay off, pay off the big debt that the British government had paid, had, had run up during the French and Indian War. But that's not true. If you read the act, it says very clearly, this isn't for paying off old expenses. This is paying off future expenses. That is the expense of maintaining these troops that are there to maintain peace between the colonists uh, and and the, the Indians. And so I can't resist the, 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 the line borrowing from modern political rhetoric that the British had decided to build this human wall on the Western border and to make the colonists pay for it. Um, and that's, that's why we get uh, the Stamp Act uh, and, and, and the Sugar Act. So there's a real sense in which these things that we all did learn about, no taxation without representation, might not have happened if the Indians hadn't been there or if they'd been completely passive or irrelevant as, as we used to be taught. So that's, I think those are a couple of ways that, that Native Americans are having a huge impact and why you've got to start with the French and Indian War because during the French and Indian War, American colonists were making the colonists, I'm sorry, were making the Indians mad and the American colonists were smuggling, trading with the enemy in the French islands like Saint-Domingue, which has become Haiti, or uh, Cuba and Puerto Rico and so forth. Um, and the colonists were, the white colonists were doing all sorts of things that infuriated the British parliament during the French and Indian War. During the war, the French, uh, the, the, uh, during the French and Indian War, the British government couldn't do anything about these things because Britain knew they couldn't win the war without the British Americans on the ground to do a, a, a most of the fighting. And so there's this real tension in London where they're just getting mad. It's almost like a balloon blowing up. There's, they're getting madder and madder at their colonists, but that anger can't be released because we got to appease the colonists till we beat the French. But as soon as they do beat the French, pop, that blows the balloon. And now we can tell the colonists uh, what we're mad at them about. And we're mad at your provoking war with Indians. And so we're going to draw a line and we're going to enforce it with soldiers paid for by you in the form of the Stamp Act uh, and, the, and the Sugar Act. So, so I would maybe go so far even as to say no Indians, no Stamp Act. So something you've heard of is powerfully influenced by a group that you may have heard of in different contexts, but not in the context of helping cause the American Revolution. Yeah, you you have this really um, really evocative moment, uh, in, and then there are many evocative moments in your book. But where you say that if all of the sugar islands had sank into the sea like Atlantis, so to the co uh, the continent, and I really think that that you know seeing that connection um, that. That, that these actions of smuggling <laughs> during this war uh, was so um, so hugely important. And this, of course, uh, is, is a reaction to the colonists. Also, they were fighting, as you said, um, for um, they, they thought they were going to get something out of this. Right. They, they thought they were going to be able to get. Um, so they felt this kind of this this um, this they felt betrayed <laughs> to a certain extent, but they were being um, being curtailed and i and i really loved that um that part of it and and i do think that um in, in some ways and, and you use kind of modern language it, it really does resonate for for what we're going through um uh um it really it really does read um in in a way that um doesn't feel like it's been so long um, that some of these same uh issues some of these same political maneuvers um that you see happening um within um 18th century america doesn't doesn't read uh so as so distant <laughs> in the past um, and, and thinking of that and thinking of um of the place of of this this hidden history that 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 you bring up. I want to uh, talk a little bit too about the place of, of um, 
of of African Americans within this um, within this world. Uh, now, there's been a lot of a kind of discussion on the place, obviously, of of, of Black history, of the history of enslavement, um, in in the founding of America, and of course. Um, not to throw a, <laughs> a giant bomb into this discussion, it, it, you, you can't um, you can't avoid um, this, and you don't you don't avoid it at all. And I want you to um, to elaborate on 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 this other kind of front of the war, um, uh, um, the, the, the Black Americans, the African Americans' um, presence uh, within um, the, the the colonial. Orbit, and as you point out, and, and and others have, that this is we're not talking about thirteen colonies; we're talking about twenty six. And this kind of presence of 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 black people of 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 slave rebellion is so so incredibly important. So please tell us more about well, how. Well, you let's start with that about the twenty six, because uh, I think some of the people watching us on YouTube will say, "Wait a minute, these guys are college professors, and they think there were twenty six colonies. Don't they know there were thirteen? There were thirteen that rebelled." But as Nicole mentioned, Britain alone had 26 colonies in America in 1776. Um, several in Canada, counting Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island and Quebec, Bahamas. There were two Floridas at the time, Bermuda. But the real jewels in the British crown were the ones that Nicole has already mentioned. And those were the sugar islands in the Caribbean, especially Barbados and Jamaica. And... Um, as much as I, as a Virginian, want to talk about tobacco, because that was the number one crop grown in North America. And of course, that was grown mostly by enslaved people in North America. Uh, tobacco was not the number one crop exported by the colonies. Sugarcane was, you know, partly for candy bars, but really because that's where you get molasses and molasses makes rum. And that's the, they, we were talking about this today. What's, what's the big early industry in North America, you know, before you have steel and even before the textile mills, the big industry is distilleries turning molasses into rum. And that's uh, molasses from sugarcane raised by slaves in um, in the in the Caribbean. And it's a reminder. Uh, I come as, as, a, as a Virginian. I come from a state that was built on slavery. People know that. But Massachusetts was built on slavery uh, as well. And New York, which you've written uh, about um, in your book, Bound by Bondage, which is going to be out on my birthday, June 15th of 2022, uh, is, shows just how dependent New York was uh, on slavery. And all of these places, uh, really, from Virginia on up, are dependent not only on the, la the, the, the labor of the enslaved people that they claim to own, but on the labor of the enslaved people in the Caribbean who are producing that molasses. And then also, they're the market. Half the fish in New England, New England's big crop was fish. Half of it goes to Catholic countries where they eat a lot of fish because they're not allowed to eat meat on Fridays and Saints days. And the refuse fish, as they called it, what an amazing evocative term. The refuse fish is what feeds enslaved people in the Caribbean. So economically, we can start there. The, the You can't name a colony where enslaved people were not significant. Even a place like Vermont, with it, which is going to be the 14th state, there were enslaved people, not a lot, but even Vermont is dependent on sending livestock uh, down to the down to the Caribbean. So, uh, so economically, they're significant. I think they become hugely significant. African Americans do uh, late in the process of the origins of the revolution. But it's a reminder to me that we've got to talk when we talk about the origin of the revolution. It's not a decision that somebody made one day. Like I, like I said at the beginning, you can't ask the question. If if you start asking why did the colonists decide to rebel, you're already going down the wrong road because it was Britain first who rebelled against the relationship and tried to change things. I talked about uh, the, the territory aspect of that and the taxes aspect of that. It's convenient for me with my students because they're all T's. Taxes, territory, uh, trade, which we've talked about smuggling molasses up from the foreign islands, that is Saint-Domingue slash Haiti and Cuba and so forth, uh, taxes, territory, trade, and we don't need to get into it today because it gets boring quick, paper money or treasury notes, the four T's. But in all those cases, it's parliament that wants change. And all the colonists, the white colonists want is no change, or they want to go back to the way things were. And so to me, one of the 
great questions is what happens around 1774 or 1775 and again mary beth norton she's always the first on the scene because she wrote a great book called 1774 about the massive change that happened in that year but during that year and she agree uh because she went into 1775 that a lot of this is going into 1775 as well what turned the colonists from just wanting to go back to forgive the barbara strice in the way we were to, from 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 nostalgia really to wanting to separate from britain those are totally different things um and what makes them want to jump the cliff into independence and i'd say in the north the biggest factor was the battle of lexington and concord uh which we correctly think of as the first battle of the revolutionary war but it's also the final argument for independence among new englanders because the, yes the boston massacre had happened but that was kind of a one-off and, and only five people were killed but at lexington 10 people were killed uh and more uh, in concord and many more uh, as the british made their way home and so many new englanders what turned them from this rational calculation of oh no we don't want to pay the sugar tax we don't pay the stamp tax and they got rid of the sugar the stamp tax but not the sugar tax and we don't want to have the tax on tea so we'll throw the tea in the heart all that those are kind of rational cal calculations about how we can get back to the good times we had in 1762. what drove those people from wanting to get back to the good old days to wanting to be a separate nation many 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 factors of course but the biggest factor in new england is the battle of lexington and concord and so that raises the question what's the south's version of the battle of lexington and concord and i would say uh, that, that the answer to that is dunmore's emancipation proclamation lord dunmore was the last royal governor of virginia and in 1775 he was massively outnumbered that is there were a few whites in virginia who were loyal to the crown but very few the vast majority of free people in virginia were supporting the revolution they still they weren't for ready for independence yet but they they were mad about all these changes that parliament was trying to impose and so he's outnumbered among whites but he doesn't have to be outnumbered because 40 percent of virginians were enslaved it's important to remember this demography uh 40 percent of so southerners in general were enslaved uh our state south carolina as you know nicole had a black majority uh, at this time so demographically we know um as well as economically which we've already talked about african americans are important but also politically because here's what happened dunmore in november of 1775 and i do think it's ironic that it was four score and seven years before abraham lincoln issued his emancipation proclamation in 1863 November of, of, of 1775, Dunmore is so outnumbered, he's so desperate for soldiers for his side that he issued an Emancipation Proclamation telling um, black men, I'm kind of hesitating on that because he said, he didn't say men, he said able and willing to bear arms. And in the 18th century, that implied men, although it's interesting to see that the majority of the African Americans who joined Governor, Governor Dunmore a slight majority were women and children right. but also a lot of men who were ready to hold muskets um and something like 800 joined him in the first few months uh and um and there are a lot of differences but there's a lot of similarities too between dunmore's emancipation proclamation and lincoln's uh in that um both were only targeting the the rebel area that is dunmore himself it's not like he issued this emancipation proclamation because he suddenly read a, a book and discovered that slavery was horrible. He had slaves himself and he kept them. Um, and so uh, so it, this was not a humanitarian gesture on his part. It was a war measure. But of course, so was Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. You know, that's how he got to do it. He kind of wanted to do it all along, but he got to do it because there was a war on. And likewise, uh, when uh, Dunmore issued his Emancipation Proclamation, it was because he needed labor. But the big thing that I would qualify about that, it's mentioned in the Declaration of, of Independence, um, very euphemistically, he has excited domestic insurrection amongst us, which we can translate as the British have stirred up our slaves against us. But the big thing I want to do, and it seems very creepy to be doing this at the National Archives where the Declaration of Independence is protected today and seen by millions of people a year, 
I want to correct the Declaration of Independence on this one point because it was not the British who stirred up the slaves. It was, if we look at the chronology, the slaves who stirred up the British because mm -hmm. Dunmore issued that Emancipation Proclamation in November of 1775, didn't he? In November of 1774 is when my fellow Virginians, Black Virginians, started to notice this yawning, this, this gap that's opening up between the white loyalist minority and the white patriot majority. And Black Virginians said, in that gap between those two factions of whites, there's opportunity for us. And they, the first record we have comes from James Madison, the future author of the Constitution and president. He noticed this meeting in, in the fall of 1774. And then there were more meetings uh, in, in there was a week in April of 1775 when there were reports all up and down the James River watershed from from Williamsburg down to Norfolk and then up uh, up to where Petersburg is uh, today of, of enslaved people organizing and being ready for the British. And long story short, Governor Dunmore in April of 1775 made white colonists mad at him. And so they started threatening him. And so he played the race card. He said, if you touch a hair on my head, this part's a quote, I will declare freedom to the slaves and reduce the town of Williamsburg to ashes. So here he is, not actually freeing slaves. This is April 1775, not November. He's, but he's threatening to do it. And so some enslaved people literally came and knocked on the door uh, of the governor's palace and said, okay, man, put us to work. You promise us freedom, we'll fight like demons on your side because we want to be free. And yeah. what did he do? He turned them away. And he said, yeah. if you come back, I'll whip you. Um, but enslaved people kept coming. Just as blacks were turned away by the Union Army in, in the early months of the, of the Civil War, and they also kept coming. And eventually, after they proved their usefulness to Governor Dunmore, only, then and only then did he uh, issue his Emancipation Proclamation. So it was really the slaves who put him up to it rather than uh, he had put the slaves up to it. But of course, whites interpreted this as the British are supposed to be protecting us from our slaves, not having our slaves uh, rebel against this. One white Virginian said, they're aiming a dagger at our throat through the hands of our slaves. Um, and they were furious. And there it is as the sort of capstone grievance in the Declaration of Independence. Not the only reason, of course, that the colonists went from wanting to restore the British Empire to where it had been in 1762, but a major reason they went from that to jumping off the cliff and declaring independence. Yeah, and I mean, it, you know, getting back into the the Declaration of Independence and um, and 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 some of the kind of more um, uh, really um, eye opening things that you talk about in terms of the Declaration uh, and thinking about how the way that we remember the Declaration today, the the, the things that resonate with us may or may not, as historians have said, um, been what people were really focused on um, uh, during the time, but this idea of life, liberty, right, and the pursuit of happiness, that being pulled out, um, not, I mean, obviously it was written <laughs> by Thomas Jefferson, but not, but, but it became popularized by, um, by black thinkers and um, veteran um, veterans of the war, specifically um, Lemuel Haynes, and I wanted to 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 get your thoughts about. Oh, yeah, let's talk. Um, let's talk about him. Um, uh, will you go to the next slide, Brian? I think that is Lemuel Haynes. Uh, uh, oh, oh okay. that we don't have time to talk about. I've talked too much, so let's go to Lemuel Haynes. Um, in uh, this is after he'd become the first um, uh, African American uh, minister of the Congregational Faith, uh, but before that. In 1776, Lemuel Haynes uh, was a free black soldier of mixed uh, uh, racial uh, parentage, but people referred to him as a free black soldier, serving in the Continental Army uh, in 1776 when uh, Congress issued the Declaration of Independence. And here's another provocative thing I'm going to say at the home of the, of the Declaration uh, of Independence, and that is there is a real sense in which the Declaration of Independence failed. It failed at its initial goal, which was to get a French Navy and a French army in American waters by the end of the summer of 1776. That's the real reason that Congress finally got its act together 
uh, and was receiving a lot of instructions as Pauline Mayer talked about from other places as well. But the reason, you know, they put it off, they've been fighting a war for more than a year, but they finally declared independence in July 76. The, 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 the record is clear. They did that to get France to come into the war on their side because they had no Navy. Uh, they had an army, but it didn't have much equipment, especially not much gunpowder. And uh, I just recently discovered that that these conversations that delegates were having in June of 1776 saying, if we can is- declare independence fast enough, we will have a French Navy in American waters fighting our battles for us by the end of the summer of 1776. So let's declare independence and get the French here. So they declared independence uh, on July 2nd, 1776, and then um, issued the press release on July 4th. Uh, and we rightly celebrate that because... The, the act of independent of declaring independence on July 2nd, that uh, that's significant, but it didn't achieve its goal. It did not get a French Navy in American waters by the summer of 76. In fact, the French didn't come in the fall or the in, in 1777 or, or, or until February of 1778. And those troops actually didn't make it till the summer of 1778. So at, toward its immediate goal, it was a failure. But it also had a phrase, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that most people who quoted the declaration in the early years passed over that because they were focused on its justification of one nation's right to secede from another or break off an alliance with another. And, and so I think your question is, is really perfect in that it, in it, it, had, it meant something completely different to white Americans at the time from what it means today. It was then a a strategic move justifying secession so that we can get French aid. But but Lemuel Haynes, of course, he was interested in that. He was in the Continental Army. He was glad to have French aid too, but he did something that nobody else had done before. And that was quote, that phrase, all men are created equal. Mm -hmm. And then as Eric Slaughter at University of Chicago says, the majority of the people who quoted the Declaration of Independence, who quoted the, the, the now iconic phrase, unalienable right to right life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. The majority of the people who quoted that between 1776, when Jefferson wrote it, and 1799, those first first quarter century, the majority of people who, who quoted it were abolitionists, uh, <laughs> black as well as white. And so they really made the Declaration of Independence what it is today. It's no longer thought of, of course, it just, the name is independence, and so it, it's no longer mostly thought of as something of the moment to get French aid. It's thought of as a universal declaration of human rights. And we really owe it to uh, first um, abolitionists like Lemuel Haynes and later women's rights activists in the 19th century who did the same thing, who turned it into the freedom document that it, that is, that it is now. Yeah, um, I, I, I really am um, really kind of intrigued by another one of your claims in the book, and I don't want to jump over too many of. I'm, I'm hoping that we're, I'm not going to get you get us off in terms of the the order of the slides, right. uh, but I do want to know um, because we are talking about um, and and you open the book um, so evocatively of you know General you know, Washington. He's in Cambridge and he's just he's sure that Gage is going to attack him, and that then you kind of drop this knowledge bomb on us that they had been, they'd fought on the same side. And that's the way you begin. So I want to know, what kind of general was George Washington? Well, what would you say? Where would you come out on this? <laughs> well, having having set my path on this provocation, for being provocative, I'm going to not turn back and say <laughs> that in the first year of the war, George Washington, he was a great manager because he was experienced managing large numbers of people. He was a large scale. He owned hundreds or claimed to own. Uh, uh, he enslaved uh, uh, hundreds of people. So he was a great manager in terms of getting getting the, the basic few supplies they had out. But as a general, as a strategist, Washington, in my opinion, and other historians, not all, uh, agree, terrible. Because he was stuck in fifth gear. That is, he was all about uh, uh, taking the initiative, being aggressive, going on offense. And the British had figured out, and actually I do have a slide for this, which we could show briefly. Brian, will you go to the next one? I think it's the very next one. Um, the, both the British and colonists other than Washington had figured out at Bunker Hill. Brian, hit the next. Oh, oh, 
Yeah, that's that's Lem Lemuel Ham's pamphlet where he quoted. He that's the very first use of the phrase um, "all men are created equal" by anyone anywhere is by this uh, enslaved, formerly enslaved person, free black guy, Lemuel Haynes. But uh, let's move on uh, to the next one. Oh shoot, we don't have time for us to read today. Or maybe we can come back to her. We gotta Sorry, come back. Keep there they are. <laughs> this is a, a modern depiction, obviously, of the Battle of Bunker Hill. After, you know, the British technically won the Battle of Bunker Hill because they captured the hill, actually, Breed's Hill. Um, and that's how they defined victory in those days. But it cost them 50% casualties. And the man who commanded the troops on the British side at Bunker Hill said afterwards, basically, crap, because yes, we won, but what did the Americans do? They ran away to the next hill. And that one cost us 50% casualties. The next one's going to cost 50% casualties and so on. And so this is in 1775 at the very beginning of the war. The guy who was going to be commander in chief for most of the war said the war is unwinnable. Mm -hmm. And so, so uh, and, and, and various others as they became the commander in chief after how uh, was Henry Clinton arrived at the same conclusion that they understood that all the Americans had to do was hide behind those dirt walls. They were going to win the war with dirt, basically more than with gunpowder. For one thing, they, didn't, they had a lot more dirt than gunpowder. Uh, and the other thing is you, you're you you're much more vulnerable uh, if you're out in an open field attacking a, a, a wooden fort uh, or redoubt like this one uh, than, than, than the guys you're, the guys in, in the redoubt. So the Americans did not have 50% casualties. Here's my larger point, which is almost everybody understood that the Americans could win the Revolutionary War if they basically just fall on the football. That is, if they don't go become aggressive. And uh, Washington just couldn't stand that. He, he was restless in rest. He had to be doing something. Uh, and you can take us to the next slide, if you will, please, Brian, uh, which is this is a map of the Boston area. And many people watching have heard of the battle of uh, or, or the, the American occupation of Dorchester Heights. So there's there's Boston, the pink part over on the left. And uh, we're reminded by this map that Boston uh, at the time uh, was uh, pretty much an island, just barely connected to the mainland uh, towards the bottom of the map. And there's another peninsula to the uh, south of it, uh, to the right on our map, and that's Dorchester Heights. Boston, uh, uh, Washington did a great job of sneaking men up there to occupy Dorchester Heights on the night of March 4th, 1776. And that's famous for chasing the British out. Um, and it's seen as Washington's first victory, chasing the British out of Boston. Right. But guess what word Washington used to describe uh, the battle of, of, of his occupying of Dorchester Heights? He talked about his disappointment. Yes. His disappointment because he didn't want them to walk away from a fight. He wanted to fight them. Uh, and so what he was hoping, I ask you, uh, you and others uh, to follow me on the map here. Okay, we'll put our guys on Dorchester Heights. That threatens Boston. So the British troops are going to come try to take uh, Dorchester Heights back from the American troops. And while they are doing that, the uh, uh, the American troops who are across the river, you see Charleston here or more to our left is Cambridge where you went. Uh, to uh, to undergraduate school, he had um, thousands of American troops over there ready to row across the river in an amphibious attack. Basically, this would have been Washington's D-Day. Yeah. Um, this launch is big amphibious attack, very ambitious. And Washington himself, after the British had left, toured Boston, saw just how, this is his word, impregnable the British defenses were, how much they built it up and how they had made barricades in every street for house to house street fighting that even he pretty much admitted that had he carried out his aggressive plan, um, then uh, it would have been a disaster for his side. And the fascinating thing for me is he kept making um, aggressive plans. Brian, will you take us to New York City on this next map? It'll take people a while to get oriented, but if you see the red stuff, you're seeing the one part of Manhattan Island that was actually New York City uh, in 1776, the British captured that that city in, on September 15th of 1776 and held it for the rest of the war. And they really turned it into Fortress New York. Yeah, and Washington was outside New York for most of the rest of the war. He spent a year, I mean, spent a, a winter in Valley Forge, as we all know, but he's outside New York. 
jonesing to attack New York. But he never did. He never tried this amphibious assault because he realized how disastrous it would have been had he gotten his druthers and had he had his chance to do an amphibious assault back in Boston. And so he would make these plans, and I think he was sincere about them, but he would always find a reason to cancel them at the last minute. And we as Americans can be glad he did, because um, had he done a disastrous assault, that's the sort of thing that would have really hurt the American cause. And so um, I start off by th this section by saying that Washington started off the, the war as a bad general. He became a great general because he learned sometimes the most effective thing for a general to do is nothing. And, right. <laughs> and his big contribution was 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 his self restraint. Yeah, and I I think this is this is so compelling to think about. Um, a lot of times too, I think that the American Revolution is portrayed, um, you know, as 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 this revolution that people are surprised that the Americans win. But you make it seem like in in your book that that this is um, that it's nearly unwinnable for the British and that if you know all the all the Americans had to do basically is get out of their own way and and the revolution would be won. <laughs> won. Yes, and that was so hard to learn because I'm really sympathetic with Washington. He had what he called chimney corner heroes <laughs> who we would refer to as you know Monday morning quarterbacks. Uh, um, yeah, everyone was saying oh come on you can get this over with quickly and 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 he's a very very proud guy you know and that's part of the enslaver mentality is to think of yourself as one of the patriarchs to quote uh to quote another slaveholder um and he, he's, he's very sensitive about his reputation and nobody likes to be called a coward but that guy least of all um but uh that to me was his real strength was that he didn't allow people gull to gull him into doing something that would may have made glory for him or it may have been, but more likely to have led disaster to disaster for the call. And again, Dorchester Heights, he was ready to go into Boston. Mm -hmm. And it was only because the British disappointed him by leaving that he didn't do it, but but he learned his lesson to to his great credit. Well, one one question I want to add, and I do want to get back to the kind of the place of um, the incredible contributions of women during the American Revolution, of course, as um, a student of, of Mary Beth Norton, I, I would be remiss not to yeah. talk more about yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you have got some really, um, um, you kind of have, you know, of course, there's the, 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 the kind of usual uh, people that we talk about during the American Revolution, but you really talk about um, um, during this revolutionary time, starting with, uh, starting with uh, this conflict um, that begins, you know, uh, in what, what is it, what we know as the French Indian War, it's Seven Years' War, um, that um, there are, are troops, right? There are there are groups of women going into battle and actually being killed. I want you to talk a little bit more about that and the place of women uh, in this narrative, um, in, in this military history narrative as well. Yes, um, the uh, and and as you know, um, uh, our shared student Riley Sutherland has uh, educated me. Uh, unfortunately, not all of it came in time for my book, so you got to look out for uh, for an article of hers that's uh, under consideration out there now called "Industrious Women" about the women of the army and the amazing contributions uh, they made. Um, uh, and I'll just mention one thing to start it off with because it was so stunning to me. Um, what a laundress does for an army, you know, if you if you think hierarchically, a laundress is pretty low in your hierarchy if you're that kind of, of thinker. But um, uh, Riley Sutherland persuaded me that laundresses saved lives in the Revolutionary War because, um, you know, the number of, of guys on the American side who got shot and died in the Revolutionary War was about 7,000. That's fewer than died in three days um, at Gettysburg. But what, like all wars until World War II, the, the big numbers, and, and I think past World War II, the big numbers are from, from disease. And after George Washington famously had the men, as Riley qualifies, because not the women, but the men of his army uh, inoculated against smallpox in 1777, uh, the way my friend uh, Elizabeth Fenn talks about in her book, Pox Americana. After smallpox was kind of off the table, the big killer was typhus. And typhus mm -hmm. is, is spread by lice. 
uh, especially lice in people's shirts. And so if you're washing clothes, you are saving lives. So yeah. you start with the, the, the um, seemingly menial tasks that have huge uh, significant, but then you end up with women, uh, for instance, since we're, is, now's a great time to talk about it because we're looking at this uh, map of New York. Uh, I said that the British captured New York City on September 15th, 1776, but they didn't capture the rest of, November, of, of New York Island until no, the following November. The last fort they captured uh, was Fort Washington, and it's right where the GWB, the George Washington Bridge, crosses over into New York. Uh, today, there was a, an American fort there, and one of the defenders uh, was a guy named Corbin working a cannon, uh, and he was cut down uh, uh, by enemy fire. And so his wife, Hannah, uh, took over and ran that, um, that battery uh, for him. Uh, and she was also injured but not killed. She ended up staying in the army and she was in the, the invalid corps, as they called it, because of her injury. She got a pension uh, and Riley and others, including Mary Beth Norton, have found pensions um, by other women. Of course, there were lots of women who would uh, file Revolutionary War pensions as widows, but there were a lot also who filed pensions for their own service. And, and Riley's great discovery was there were these women who would file a pension application, a, a widow's pension application, but then when you read the narrative where they're describing why they deserve this application, they would talk about all the heroic things they did as well. Yeah. So technically, I'm asking for this because my husband served the way spouses get pension application, get widow's application, uh, widow, widow's benefits now. But then they were bragging about the amazing things that they did as well. Yeah, this is this is so com this is such compelling stuff. And I think that the, 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 the narratives that come out, the lives, the everyday lives, uh, that come out and are woven within this this um, this this kind of broad um, um, and sprawling really history of this moment uh, um, that we think we know um, is is really compelling. And I know we've only got about um, it, uh, about uh, seven minutes left now, but we do have an audience question, um, and um, we have a request to talk about the Quebec Act. Can you give us some insight on 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 that? Yes. Um, and and actually, Brian, if you're still able to do images, you could take us back to the second image, the big map that uh, with Native Americans. It'll help people a little bit um, because um, it is on the one hand, it's really important to say that there was no march to independence in, in the sense that an army marches in lock, you know, a good army marches in lockstep because different colonies got mad at different things the British were doing at different times. And so they're sort of straggled out along the road with, um, you know, New York didn't even come along. Thanks, Brian. But New York didn't even come along in time to vote for independence on July 2nd. Right. It was a unanimous vote, but not 13 to nothing, 12 to nothing. The state that you wrote about in Bound for Bondage was uh, the colony. <laughs> Uh, wasn't ready to be a state quite yet. They did come along in time to sign the eventually, eventually in August. Yeah, yeah. But uh, but anyway, so so on the one hand, we want to notice what stragglers there were. You know, there were people way out in front and there were people way behind. On the other hand, there were a few things the British did that were truly unifying acts. And the Quebec Act was one of those because it affected just about all of the free colonists. Um, it, it, it was seen as establishing the Catholic faith mm -hmm. in Quebec. And I have to say, from our modern perspective, we really have to admire the British government for being willing to allow uh, Catholics in, in Quebec to continue worshiping as Catholics because um, Britain was very much a Protestant country at the time. Catholics, for instance, couldn't even vote uh, in the mother country. And they didn't give Catholics in Quebec the right to vote, but they did give them the right to basically tax themselves to pay for the church. Most of the colonies, most of all, out of all 26 colonies, in most of them, there were church taxes and you had to pay for the established church. And so that's the Anglican or Episcopal church in Virginia, uh, and it's the Puritan church in Massachusetts and so forth. But the big church that most of the colonists, not Native Americans, although some Native Americans, belonged to in Canada was the Catholic church. Mm -hmm. And the British government tolerated that, allowed them to have church taxes for the Catholic Church. Well, that infuriated the Puritans of New England. Puritan doesn't mean sexual purity. It means purify our church of any Catholic vestiges. They were bigots uh, against Catholics. And so they were furious that the Catholic faith was going to be tolerated there. 
And there was also a political problem. If we're not going to let Catholics vote, then we're only going to let this tiny percentage of the Quebec population who were Protestant vote. And that doesn't seem fair. So the king decided, the parliament decided that they'd have an appointed council running things. So that's a very undemocratic system. It is undemocratic, but it's the only solution they could think of. But that makes everybody mad because, as Jefferson said, oh, they're, they're, they're using Quebec as a fit instrument. That is a, sort of a model for how, what they want to do the rest of us. But then the thing that really unified the colonists against the Quebec Act of 1774 was that it took all of that land, basically the land that's, that's shaded here, uh, west of the Ohio River, uh, and gave it to a Quebec. And you can't name anybody in Virginia uh, uh, who was a leader of the revolution, Jefferson, Washington, Franklin, um, in Pennsylvania, uh, uh, um, uh, Patrick Henry. You can't name anybody who was a leader of the revolution in places like Pennsylvania and Virginia who wasn't also a land speculator. And oh, yeah. taking all that land and making it part of Ohio, I mean, making it part of Quebec, all that uh, that area that is now the state of Ohio, Indiana, in Illinois, that really cut the legs off of the land speculators and made them really mad. So that was <laughs> certainly a factor. Well, I want to, um, 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 as we are getting closer to the end, I, I wanted to uh, um, open it up for you to say any closing thoughts. I know there were some other things we wanted to talk about in terms of where do you come down in the debate, whether it was militia or regular armory soldiers who won the war. Let's do that one. Let's do that one. Hey, Brian, right. Brian, will you go to the very, um, uh, I think it's it's uh, maybe the second to last slide or the last slide. It's got two images. One is a, uh, they're, they're the same map, but you can't pretend they're the same map. But one is an aerial photo. That's it. That's it. Yeah. So, guys, this is what I think. It, it sort of encompasses the whole thing I was trying to do in the book. Um, so these are, an, the bottom one is an aerial map of the Battle of Calpins, um, of where that was fought. And the top one is a drawing uh, that was published in a great book, by the way, by Commager and Morris called Spirit of 76. But um, they're both reflecting on something that um, the General Morgan, who was on the American side there, and who ended up winning that battle, but he also almost lost it at, at, early on. Um, and he lost, to, had he lost, and the reason he did poorly at the start was that he was fighting the British in an open field. And people said, Dan, you know, congratulations on winning, but how dumb of you to fight them in an open field. He said, oh, no, no. Uh, and they go, why didn't you cross the Broad River? And he said, oh, I didn't have time to cross. I'm, I'm sorry. He said, I deliberately didn't cross the Broad River. I backed my militiamen up against the Broad River because they were cowards. And had I crossed the river, they would have all run away. And so I forced my men to fight by backing them up against the Broad River. And wow. um, and, and so, so it's sort of a mean thing for him to say about the guys who actually helped him win the battle. Right, right. It's also false because here's a, 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 an undoctored photo um, uh, of, of from the air. Do you see the green circle at the bottom? That's the Calpins yeah. battlefield. You see the North Carolina, uh, South Carolina line. And then way north of that is the Broad River, also with a green uh -huh. oval around it. The Broad River is actually five miles away. Yeah. But everybody almost who does uh, maps of this battle makes it seem like the Broad River is right behind the American lines. Right. Because that's what General Morgan said. And that's the kind of myth that we need to penetrate. This was really unfair to the militia. Look, militia did screw up in various times. We all screw up at various times, but they didn't screw up in Calpins. And it was really uh, unfair of, of, of Morgan to throw them under the bus, as we would say today. And, and we can fix that with, with aerial photos in this case. Oh, that is so fantastic. I love how you can see how kind of mapping now and these days can make... Um, make these types of questions about the 18th century come alive. Um, well, thank you so much. And um, uh, I, I you're, this book is a compelling read. Um, I can't put it down. <laughs> so um, uh, so um, I, I really highly encourage everyone to get Liberty is Sweet, um, A Hidden History of the American Revolution. Uh, it really is wonderful. Thank you so much, Woody, for your time and for really breaking open this moment uh, in history that is still so present for us um, in a way that is engaging and, and really compelling. Well, I really appreciate your, your talking to me about it, Nicole. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you.